The First World War was the seminal tragedy of the 20th century. The conflict was long in the making, with many international crises preceding it like the First and the Second Moroccan Crisis. But still, no one expected the conflict to be a war on such a massive scale. For many nations it was about prestige, about irredentism, about revenge, but the longer the war dragged on, the more it became about survival. The societies of the combatant states heavily felt the influence in nearly all regions of their respective empires. Everyone either lost close friends and family members or knew people who had lost loved ones personally. And this manifested in a strong aversion of conflict in broader society. Now, while the winners of the war, like France, America and Britain, could at least somewhat enjoy their victory, others had a way rougher time. And with others, I mean Germany, and with a rougher time, I mean basically radical parties being in open conflict with each other on the streets. A little more than 10 years later, this ultimately led the National Socialists to winning this conflict and lead the Third Reich into devastation. But what if the Social Democrats or their more radical comrades of the Communist Party would win this struggle for power? But first some history. The Germans not only had to bear the guilt of starting the war, they also had to cede many territories that they understood as historical homelands of the German people like parts of Western Prussia and Alsace-Lorraine. They had to pay an enormous amount of debt to the Entente, who also occupied the whole of the Rhineland where the German government couldn't pay up anymore. And last but not least, several groups fought for power within Germany itself. When the First World War ended, the German Republic was actually announced twice, because the way the Germans fell didn't quite fit their orderly and precise stereotype. When in 1918, the German marines in Kiel denied a suicidal order from their higher-ups, a revolutionary wave swept throughout northern Germany, spreading to Hamburg and many other cities, who set up councils of soldiers and workers along its way. So, when push came to shove, the Social Democrats in Berlin rose up and proclaimed the highest honor of the German people and the declaration of the German Republic. After which, the communists announced the red flag of revolution shall replace the imperial flag, and also declared Germany to be a free republic. So you might wonder, why did this happen? Well, back in 1914, when the war broke out, the socialists weren't a big fan of this, being the party of the workers and supporting peace between the lower classes in an international struggle for world revolution and all that. But when war was declared between Germany and Russia, the German Democratic Socialist joined into the jingoism of the nation, which eventually led to the secession of the independent Democratic Socialist Party, which would later become the Communist Party of Germany. The party leaders both essentially were socialist, but one would become the leader of the Communist Party until being murdered by death squads under the order of his socialist comrades, while in the meantime the Social Democratic Party of Germany would try to stabilize the Republic. But their candidates would get outvoted just one year later. In the next seven years, the newly democratic Germany would change their chancellor ten times, between the Social Democrats, the Conservatives and the Liberals. The government, even under Social Democratic leadership, would go on to send the military as well as death squads to crush the Communists. This led to the Red Red Brother War in Germany, binding a lot of resources and personnel of the German left. Essentially, there was a decade-long fight between socialist and communist, which paved the way for the reactionary National Socialism to come out on top in Germany. But today, we'll take a look at how it all could have turned out differently. The point of departure that makes the most sense to me is when the Republic is declared, the mass of the Berlin workers back the communists instead of the socialists. Now, we have to keep in mind that this alone doesn't mean much since the rest of the nation prefers the socialists over the communists. But this forces the parliament to acknowledge the secure position of the communists, making it way harder to order the death of the communists through their friends in the military. So now we have to get into the swamp of politics. Since the communists and the socialists still weren't exactly friends with each other, they would probably try to limit each other political influence, much like they did in our own timeline. But with the majority of the workers backing the communists right after the war, they can't publicly denounce each other as much, 
otherwise they would both risk their own shot at power. So both parties remain in an uneasy peace. There would still be many violent acts between the rightist Freikorps and the German left, which would continue to escalate further and further, eventually leading to the death of several prominent leftists in Germany. But the difference in this timeline is that the socialists aren't responsible for this murder. Since the German Freikorps still exists and is out for blood, the party leaders of the communists are in the spotlight. And with the over 300 other political assassinations that the German right orchestrated during the first years of the Republic, they'd hardly miss out on the communist leadership. Since in our timeline this was ordered by the Social Democrats, it furthered the conflict between the leftist parties. But now this is perceived as an external threat by a shared political opponent. If only the communist leaders were targeted, this wouldn't be enough to mend the leftist schism. But a lot of dead Democratic Party leaders later, they would eventually come to the conclusion that it'd be in their best interest to do something about the nationalists and their friends in the military first. So what would they do? Since the Communist Party was the product of secession of the Social Democrats, we would expect them to just unify again, right? Sadly, no. Ever since the murder of the Communist Party leaders, they were pretty suspicious about any supposed allies. Because even though they had to face this killing spree, this doesn't mean that they forgive the Social Democrats for letting the Kaiser bring about war in Europe. Instead, the Iron Front forms much sooner. The Iron Front was, and still would be, an organization that would fight off the enemies of the Republic, mainly killing reactionary nationalists. So essentially, the situation on the streets remains the same, and there is political violence and an unstable economy in the nation. On a political level, the government would struggle enormously, since the Republic is still under heavy pressure with having to pay the war reparations and the French occupying the Rhineland, economic troubles are a given. No government can change the fact that when your country is war-thorn and a huge part of your income is vaporized, that you are going to be hurting quite a lot. So, with the Social Democrats and the Communists not being in open conflict, they'd have to work together on solutions to these problems. The only issue is, in the first election they would only hold 45% of the votes. But since most other parties were either too small or unwilling to join a greater coalition, they could hold onto office in a minority government. But now, their time to shine has come. In response to a failed coup by German rightist, the Ruhr uprising would begin which would mainly see fights between the left and the right in the Ruhr area. In our own timeline, these riots eventually simply died down. But in this alternate scenario, the workers would instead go on to claim the factories for themselves, and the communists are eager to support that claim. Since the socialists and the communists are working together politically to have any shot at power, the socialists would have to support the communists in this action. So the issue is put up to a vote and the overwhelming majority of the working class votes for keeping the factories as worker-owned collectives. This sets precedence in German history and really riles up conservative and reactionary voters. But in the end, they can't win against state power and the Iron Front at the same time. So they would have to deal with it, or in the case of some businessmen, leave the country prematurely to avoid from being disowned as well. Now do note that this single vote doesn't suddenly turn all of Germany communist, but it does pave the way for further reforms on how property rights relating to communities have to be handled. These reforms, however, would be very slow, since the German institutions are still remnants of the previous governments, meaning that they work actively against the current government's policies, or they are freshly staffed with inexperienced socialist personnel. But back to this legal reform giving workers the right to either dispossess or, more likely, if the Social Democrats manage to force the Communists to agree to a more conservative approach, to buy up their former employers' companies. And this pseudo-communism is something that the Western Allied powers really feared. Which is why in this universe, even though there is no Anschluss and no occupation of Czechoslovakia, the Allied powers have few greater fears than the German Federal Republic. While Germany is still going through its troubled post-war period, other struggles around Europe set up the stage for their shared future. In Italy, the socialists and the fascists under Mussolini are in a relentless conflict, not unlike Germany's. So when the fascists are done with murdering their ideological arch enemies, they would turn towards the public and take over the nation. 
Italy would now be a fascist state, sharing the same goals it did in their own timeline. Meanwhile, in the East, the Russians are also embroiled in a civil war, in which the Soviets manage to come out on top, although it takes them some time. Let's now fast forward a few years. The leftist German government was able to consolidate power, and with a bit of luck, even though the Union-owned factories have somewhat of a hard time starting off, they would manage to stay afloat and work just as efficiently as their competitors. Without decentralized state planning, they would manage to still operate with a profit motive, with the main difference being is that the profit is shared among the workers instead of going disproportionately to the owners. Since the government is providing the legal framework through which workers are able to expropriate their bosses, the rate of worker-owned collectives slowly but steadily rises in Germany, as well as German industrial might in Europe as a whole. By now, Russia is in the grips of the Soviets and after Lenin's death, Stalin still takes over to turn the nation essentially into one big authoritarian hellhole. Excuse me, socialist republic. National Bolshevism still shows its ugly face. Now despite both Germany and Russia are proclaiming to practice socialism, the difference is pretty obvious and though the German communists like the whole idea of dictatorship of the proletariat, the socialists do hold them back. So now we slowly but surely enter into the 1930s. So before we come up to the foreign policy events, let's look at the German state and how society has shaped up until now. Since the Iron Front was established much sooner and the state isn't in bed with them, the extreme right isn't as big of a problem. Though fights in the streets still occur from time to time, especially in the bigger cities, some of which the left has no majority in, like Munich, Stuttgart and others in the south. The left has built up a stronghold in northern Germany and enjoys wide popularity, expanding their influence even more via youth groups. The dust in the state institutions has settled, and though some old reactionary officials remain, the overall staff of the state has been replaced by ideologues who more often than not aren't the most qualified person for the job, since they haven't been chosen for their competence, but for their loyalty to the ideology. When the Great Recession hits, the German economic situation would still be in the gutter, because neither private nor communally owned companies can handle the crash of the American banks, and it galvanizes society even further, benefiting both extremes, with mainly the left in Germany profiting since they go on about how the capitalists have manufactured this crisis. So let's now take a look at the world stage. Since the Poles at that time were pretty irredentist in their territorial claims, and confident in their ability by their victory over the Soviets, they would let the tensions with the Germans rise, claiming Danzig and the bulk of the Prussian territory for themselves. Since they are also having border issues with the Soviets, Lithuania and Czechoslovakia, and Germany isn't nearly as aggressive as in their own timeline, Poland would have a hard time finding friends, even though Britain and France still team up with them to provide some counterweight to the terrifying presence of two huge socialist neighbors. While the Germans looked to the Soviet border with suspicion, the Germans would come to an understanding with the Soviets that they would like an insurance. In case the Poles do something stupid, the Soviets would come in from the east to defend the Germans in exchange for some territory which the Soviets consider Ukrainian or Belarusian. Meanwhile, Spain is still having a messy civil war. There are the monarchists, the anarchists, the democrats and the fascists. Without German support for the fascists, the latter would have somewhat of a harder time. But the Italians do still like the idea of having a Mediterranean fascist friend in the region, leading to massive Italian support for the fascists in Spain. At the same time, the socialists receive help from the Germans and the Soviets, and the entire balance of power in the Spanish Civil War would be radically altered from our own timeline. For this scenario, the eventual outcome of the civil war doesn't matter too much, so I leave it up to you in the comments to decide who would win this alternate civil war with German support swapped. But back to the Poles. They would still go on to assert their authority over the city-state of Danzig, just like in our own timeline, betting on the German leadership being too weak and hesitant to escalate. But with the insurance by the Soviets that they would support the German war effort, the Germans do the unexpected. They claim that Poland is trying to start an armed conflict and without a declaration of war, the Germans start occupying Danzig, Posen and some other border regions. So now the Poles are in trouble. They can't take these territories back without employing their army. But if they did that, 
then they would enter a conflict that they know they can't win. Meanwhile, the Western diplomats are in disarray. What should they do? Should they try to force Germany to stand back? But how? In the end, they come to the conclusion that there are no venues of making Germany stop without prompting a full-on war. The Western Allies would start many diplomatic talks between all parties involved, while advising the Polish government to reach out and de-escalate the conflict. But it is too late for that by now. The Polish government can turn back, the public outcry is too great, and Poland announces full mobilization. The German goals for this war are mainly the seizure of formerly German territories, while the Soviets are aiming to reclaim the lands lost in the previous Soviet-Polish war. The results would be the borders that look a little bit like this. But the real interesting stuff happens on the Western Front. Since Germany has no ambition to conquer France, it is somewhat hard for me to imagine that they would push forward with little to no provocation. But it should be obvious that Germany can't win against Britain and France on its own, especially not in the long term. And since the Soviets don't join the war against the Western powers, they'd have a pretty hard time. Even though the strategic incentive is there, I don't see the Germans rolling over the Scandinavians or the Benelux in this timeline. When they did that in their own timeline, it was because of a total war doctrine and the acceptance of similar ideas in the military, which isn't a given in this scenario. Especially considering that the Nazi generals were absolutely revolutionary in their way of warfare, and they probably wouldn't be employed by this alternate leftist government. Or at least, many of them wouldn't be. So, this conflict would resemble the First World War in so far as we'd come to somewhat of a standstill along the immediate Franco-German borders, after some back and forth in the surrounding area. Though, after the Germans and the Allies have bled out somewhat, and it would become obvious that the Germans wouldn't be able to press through the Maginot Line, Stalin would eventually start supporting the German war effort, first by sending a Soviet expeditionary force, before, significantly later, the Soviets simply joined the war on the German side. Does that mean that with Soviet support, Germany now conquers France? Once again, no. The Soviet forces would concentrate on the British colonies and try to occupy areas to their south. Though they would eventually try to pressure the French troop in a meaningful way, there simply wouldn't be a need to try and take the entirety of France. For Stalin, this war was about getting a better position at the eventual peace table, and in the best case scenario, gaining some warm water ports to their south. But since they wouldn't gain any of that by throwing manpower at France, the Western Front still remains stuck. It would also very well be possible that the Soviets don't come out to support the Germans until after they've secured mainland China and Korea, which they tried to do as soon as Japan and America would go to war with each other. This conflict would perhaps finish even quicker, since with the United States and the Soviets breathing down the neck of the Japanese, the Japanese would lose on all fronts significantly faster than in our own timeline. The Japanese would surrender before any nuclear capabilities would be developed by the Americans. Especially since without the persecution of the Jews, Germany doesn't drive their Jewish scientists to America. For example, Albert Einstein was a socialist himself, so there is little reason for him to leave Germany in this alternate timeline. So, with the Soviet fleet being practically non-existent in the Pacific during this time, they would essentially only be able to conquer anything they bordered by land. While America, in the meantime, would fight Japan on its own, since Britain and France would be busy fighting Germany in Europe. Since in this timeline, Germany didn't join Japan in its war against the Americans, the Americans wouldn't be at war with Germany directly, at least officially. Although America would still supply the Western Europeans with massive amounts of weapons and loads. But the Americans would still be afraid of the developments in Europe, and so Roosevelt would still be winning to join the war. But without being attacked by Germany, it would be much harder to whip up the population to approve of this European war, resulting with the United States siding with France and Britain later than in our own timeline, maybe not even joining as a full combatant at all. But even though Japan is defeated, and the Allies would have taken much of Asia, and America would come into Europe to support the Western war effort, it wouldn't change much. A stalemate would continue on the Franco-German border, and eventually the Americans would try to get all participating nations to agree on a peace deal, since the Americans prefer European nations exporting their goods rather than strangle each other to death in this rather useless war. Also, the rumors about some German scientists trying to develop a bomb of unimaginable power 
doesn't really make them feel comfortable. So they wouldn't really appreciate prolonging this conflict much further and the eventual peace deal would look something like this. No major border changes in Europe and Iran and many states in mainland East Asia would become Soviet satellite states. After the war, Germany and Russia would finally have to deal with the question of how to integrate the Balkans into their spheres of influence. Stalin would argue that cultural proximity would align the Balkans closer with the Soviets than with the Germans, even though Yugoslavia and Romania would be rather welcoming of the Germans. This war has damaged the British, French and German economies extremely hard, but not all hope is lost. The German government is more than willing to sign more treaties with the Soviets to essentially trade technology for resources. This whole war did for them what the great patriotic war did for Russia in our timeline, solidifying the leftist rule and by winning back some territories in the east massively increasing their popularity. Since their industry is mainly damaged in the west, the less developed but still industrializing eastern part of the nations are unharmed and they are able to rebuild there pretty quickly. With their shared control over the Balkans, they are more than happy to invite Eastern Europeans to supplement their lacking labor pool. Between the Western Europeans, Britain is the clear winner of the war. Because when compared to France, their industry hasn't suffered at all. German artillery and rockets would have ravaged Northern France and limited its industrial capabilities severely. So when peace does finally come and they are no longer supported by the Americans, the French start to have a pretty difficult time. But still, America would be more than willing to help both of them out financially, since they are worried that France would turn red if they have suffered too hard under the consequences of the war. The Western Europeans would cling on to their colonial empires, and decolonization is delayed. NATO would be founded, but it would be way smaller than their own timeline, with nations like the Benelux and Scandinavia seeing little reason to join this military operation. During the war, Italy would have remained relatively neutral trying to gain whatever concessions it could from both sides during the war. But now they would have to pick a side between either the socialists or the Americans. While the Italians don't directly join NATO, they would still be very western aligned since Mussolini and his fascist friends really don't like the communists. The French would be somewhat of a wild card during this alternate cold war. There was a strong leftist movement in France, and if France falls upon some hard times, it isn't unlikely to think that this leftist movement might gain power here as well. It is very well possible that France in this timeline gets a similar treatment to West Germany in our own, meaning that the American credits ramp up their industrial capabilities and the government tries to implement some soft socialist measures like universal healthcare, free education and so on. This would probably silence the moderate wing of the French socialists and ensure their place in the Western Bloc. During the Cold War, the joint Soviet-German Bloc were trying to spread socialism across the world, trying to get the more unaligned nations on their side to gain an edge over the Western powers. So now, let's take a look at the German-Chinese relationship. The Sino-Soviet split occurs in this timeline a little bit later, since the Russians could, through their fights with Japan, potentially have picked any high-profile Chinese communist they wanted to. Meaning that it is possible that instead of Mao, they get some high-ranking Moscow-aligned politician to rule China in this alternate timeline. Although it's also very well possible that Mao simply stays on as the chairman of this new communist China. So assuming the Sino-Soviet split does still happen, it's very well possible that the Germans step in to replace the Soviets as the leading ally of the Chinese. With this more socialist Germany, the Austrian moustache man is eventually accepted into an art school and tries to pursue local politics as a loyal party member, although never actually being elected into any office. So from this point onwards, the scenario becomes impossible to predict. Maybe Germany will stagnate just like the Soviets did in our own timeline. Or maybe the Berlin-Moscow dream team goes on to topple every African state until they've all turned red. Let us know in the comments what you think might happen next. As always, thank you all for watching. Leave a like and a comment to help us against the algorithm. Even just commenting hi helps us out massively. This scenario wasn't actually written by me, but was the first scenario written by the channel partner Ericon. Do let us know what you thought of this scenario in the comments. Do subscribe for more videos, as one new alternate history video will release every single Friday, as well as a podcast on Sunday, miscellaneous videos on Monday and a viewer scenario contest on Wednesday.
more than enough history content to subscribe for, I'd say. So, once again, thank you all for watching and goodbye.